to just record the session for folks that might miss it, if it's okay for them to see this. All right. Thing. Yeah. So with good. that, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Brent, for the, the introduction. And um, yeah, I'm uh, excited to have been invited to give this talk today. Uh, I just, um, or as mentioned, I just defended my, my dissertation a few weeks ago. So some of this is a little bit of a repeat of, of that talk, but also uh, trying to integrate some of the background studies that went into it. Um, and so I, I'll uh, go ahead and jump in. And whoop, here we go. So I, I wanted to start off with just sort of this thought experiment of imagining that you're out walking through a forest, maybe the last time you were out in the woods. And what are some of the things that you might be thinking of? Now, for me, I'm generally thinking about what different tree species I might be finding out there, things like oak or maple or sassafras. Um, if you've never uh, torn a, a leaf of sassafras, it smells like Fruit Loops, kind of a, a, a fun thing to do as you're out walking through the woods. I also think about the different wildlife that I might be seeing out there, things like birds or deer, squirrels, all these different species that call forests their home. I'm also thinking about the reasons why I'm out in the forest. Besides doing research um, for the FNR department, I'm also out there quite often for different recreational purposes, things like hunting and backpacking and so on. And I also am thinking about what the physical environment of that forest might be like. Maybe the trees are blocking some of the wind and it gets more humid um, as you're walking through there, or maybe you know, thinking about like with this photo, how the light is coming through the canopy. And a few years back, Susan Kalis from the University of Tennessee visited the FNR department and gave a seminar. And she talked about how we all have a baseline forest. So we all have this forest that we think of, um, that's sort of what, what we uh, imagine a, a forest to be. But the question is, what does that forest look like in say the next 50 years? How is it different? And so ideally we'd be finding that these trees are getting older and so they'd be bigger and taller. Maybe some of the species that you found are starting to die out and being replaced by other ones through natural progressions like succession. But of course, there's a lot of major threats to our forests. We're seeing things like invasive species taking over, um, different plants and insects that have invaded our forests and um, are, are causing tons of damage. We're also seeing lots of socioeconomic impacts, um, human mediated uh, impacts on forests like deforestation, urbanization, fragmentation and so on that are really altering the landscape of, of our forest ecosystems. And of course today being Earth Day 2020, um, the theme was climate action and how um, trying to think about how climate change is one of the, the biggest challenges for both our natural ecosystems and for uh, humanity as a whole. And so in terms of climate change, we've seen dramatic shifts over the last three decades in both temperature and precipitation. Temperature has risen by upwards of a degree and a half Celsius over the last three decades in the Eastern US, as well as uh, plus or minus 150 millimeters per year of precipitation uh, change over that same time period. And you're probably familiar with, with one of these, or this figure from the IPCC, IPCC assessment report showing that not only is climate change happening now, but it's expected to continue to, to happen into the future uh, with most projections. Um, warming and uh, increased extreme events and, and precipitation variability and so on. And so as ecologists, we study climate change uh, in many different ways. Uh, some of them are more related to the abiotic factors, sort of the natural environment, looking at things like drought or nutrient cycling or greenhouse effects. And then we also, as ecologists, of course, are thinking about the biological systems and different biotic factors that might be impacted by climate change. Things like phenology, when the leaves are coming out, uh, when, uh, when species are going to be migrating, different measures of productivity or biodiversity and how these are all impacted by climate change. And so today I want to talk about two main studies. The first one looking at uh, tree species migration and the second looking at how these migrations influence the, the forest communities. And so this first paper was published a few years back in the journal Science Advances, um, which was led by my advisor, Songwen Fei. Uh, 
And so over the last few decades, people have been trying to show how species are responding to climate change. And a lot of studies have shown that, that they're uh, tending to move northward toward climate are, are wide ranging. There have been studies that have used modeling, like species distribution models, to see what uh, climate aligns best with where species should be. Also, things like observational data, you know, local scale plot level data, trying to look at changes in species abundance, and and then different experiments that have actually uh, altered the climate and seen how. Uh, species respond to, to say warming or drought. And then of course there's uh, these sort of big data or data-driven analyses that, that are uh, sort of a, a way of, of asking, well, what does data actually tell us about how species are responding to climate change? And so in these studies, we, we uh, used a, a, a <clears throat> data from the US Forest Service's Forest Inventory and Analysis Program or FIA. And so there's about 80,000 FIA plots in the Eastern US in our study area, um, but there's a total of about 130,000 of them across uh, the entire US, including Alaska and, and Hawaii. And that equates to about one plot per 6,000 acres of land. This FIA program has been going on for 90 years now. The first uh, inventory was back in 1930, um, but has really ramped up over the last few decades. And so, Historically, they used what, what's known as periodic sampling, where they would, an entire state would go out and sample all of their plots every 10 years or so. Um, but more recently, um, since the early 2000s, they switched over to this panel system where they're sampling um, every five to seven years. So they, they go out and they, they get a fifth to a seventh of the data each year and then um, report these new, new measurements every year. Um, and of course, since there's so many plots, these, these data are constantly being updated in the, in the database um, with new entries on sort of daily to weekly timescales, depending on when you're pulling your data from. And so what we did um, to look at how climate change is affecting these forests, we, we pulled data from two main time periods. The first one being uh, one of the periodic um, measurements that was completed back in 1980 to 1995, depending on the state, um, in order to get complete coverage. And then one of the more recent uh, panel systems that was uh, compiled in 2013 to 2015. So what we did then is, is selected 86 different species from this data set that were some of the most abundant species in the Eastern US. And then we, we aggregated this data to uh, a 1400 square kilometer hexagon tessellation you can kind of see that in the, in the figure on the right. Um, this is sort of an average county size um, hexagon. We, we originally tried using uh, hexagons as our sampling units, but since, or sorry, using counties as our, as our sampling units. Uh, but since they vary in size, you sort of get, you know, bigger counties tend to have more forests. Um, and this also allowed us to align our time one and time two data because these plots weren't all sampled at both time periods. And so in this first study, we used the measure of species abundance, um, the relative stem density, which is basically just saying how many of each species are there. And so again, using this FIA data, it it sort of fits into this framework of the, the four Vs of big data. The volume, there's lots of data. Velocity, data is coming in quickly. Variety, there's multiple data sources. And uh, veracity, that this data um, is hopefully reliable. So in terms of volume, again, we had 80,000 FIA plots. We had about 720 different climate layers that went into creating uh, climate normal um, maps. Again, FI data is coming in at, at sort of an annual time scale, which for forest inventory data is, is quite quickly moving. You know, it's not as fast as say weather station data, but for, for forest inventories, that's, that's quite quick. We're also using a variety of, of uh, data sources in these studies, looking at FIA, also PRISM climate data, 
polymer drought severity index, nitrogen deposition, fire frequency, um, and so on. And then in terms of veracity and data reliability, there's, there's of course, some behind the scenes QAQC that goes on from you know, these different data sources, but then also some data filtering that we do ourselves and uh, things like model selection and using multiple lines of evidence to support our, our conclusions about how these forests are responding. And so with this first study looking at, at species level movements, the big question was how are these species actually moving? How are these tree species shifting their distributions? And so you can think of this as sort of like you're a waiter in a restaurant and you need to carry a, a tray of drinks to a table. And so you're, you're balancing this tray on one, one hand and depending on where the bigger or smaller drinks are, you might have to shift your, your hand around. So you'd have it at a certain point for the first tray, a different point for your next set of drinks, and then you could look at how you had to shift your hand to, to meet those two sort of balance points. Um, and you can get sort of the, the direction that you had to, to move your hand as well as how far along the tray you had to move it. And so we can apply this same approach to our, our tree species data. So we could see where the species is most abundant at a one time period um, and sort of calculate its, its sort of center of mass. And then do the same thing in the second time period and look at the difference between these two to see how far and in what direction these, these species actually shifted. And so what we found with this analysis is that many of these species are shifting westward. So we found about half of the species had significant longitudinal shifts east or west, um, but most of them were shifting westward, about uh, or 41 out of the 86 species shifted west, but only five of them shifted east. Similarly, we found about half of the species had uh, significant latitudinal shifts. So we had about, uh, or we had 43 of the, the species that, that shifted either north or south, um, but it wasn't quite as clear of a split as east and west. There was about a third that went north and then about a sixth that went south. And so when you put this together, looking at both the latitude and longitude of how these, these species shifted, generally these species are moving in sort of a northwest direction. And so when we looked at what might actually be causing these movements, we found that the change in precipitation was the best predictor of these changes in relative uh, stem density. So areas that became wetter tended to increase in these species. And you can see that follows sort of that northwest gradient where it became quite, uh, quite a bit drier in the southeast. Um, and, and wetter in, in sort of the center, or more towards the, the central US. And so we're able to sort of add another piece to this puzzle that not only are species moving upward and northward trying to track with changing temperatures, there's also a westward component to, to much of their movements tracking with uh, changes in precipitation. And so that brought us to our second study then. Um, and so this, this paper was published just a couple of weeks ago in Global Ecology and Biogeography. Um, and so it's available on their website in early view and will hopefully be out in an issue uh, coming up in the next couple of months. And so the thought here is that as these species start shifting their distributions or um, perhaps uh, the Ents invading Isengard per se, um, the question was whether these species are starting to impact the communities. Are we seeing these species in with new communities or are we seeing species take off from their historic community? Or are we seeing that these communities as a whole are starting to move together and, and shift around the country? And so identifying uh, communities has been one of the longstanding questions in ecology dating back to the early 1900s. There um, were some debates um, about whether these communities are just sort of each individual species reacting to, to environmental gradients or if these communities as a whole are sort of a super organism that, that morphs and changes and, and uh, acts together. But of course these older methods were, were based primarily on, on limited data and you know very simple statistics or anecdotal evidence but in this era of big data, we're able to use some new uh, advanced statistical techniques to really dive into what the data tells us. And so what we used for this study 
is known as latent DR clay allocation or LDA. And this model was originally developed as a text mining model or, or topic model for identifying the main concepts or, or topics within uh, text data. So what you would normally do is you would take a, a, a bunch of documents, uh, feed it into the LDA model, and it would figure out what are the most frequently co-occurring words, um, and these would become part of a, a different concept. Um, so for example, if you gave it a bunch of cookbooks, you would find that the frequently co-occurring words of pie, cake, and sugar are all part of this concept that you might call dessert. And so we can use this model then with our FIA data and actually um, look at what, what the frequently co-occurring species are in these different plots. So we, we feed this algorithm out uh, our FIA data and it might pick up that species like beech maple and ash are all commonly co-occurring in uh, the beech maple community of the northern hardwood region, or yeah, the northern hardwood region. And so here we're, we again used uh, the FIA data and more or less the same data set. We did end up uh, updating to a few years newer um, FIA data for our second time period. And we also ended up dropping one species that um, seemed to have a little bit of a, a sampling bias that we, we were a little uncertain about. Um, in terms of our um, aggregation, instead of aggregating our data to the hexagon level, we ended up running our models at the plot level and then aggregating our results to compare between time one and time two. And then finally, our measure of species abundance that we used in um, this study, instead of using just the, the relative density, uh, we also incorporated a relative basal area in, in a measure known as importance value. And this basically just balances out the size and number of trees so that you have uh, a few big trees sort of balancing out with a lot of small trees. And so with this study, I wanted to answer a few specific questions. First off, how has the species composition of these communities changed? Are we seeing as these uh, species are migrating, are they causing the composition of these different communities to, to change as well? Second, I want to see whether the spatial distribution of these communities has changed. Are they uh, moving as a whole around the country? And then assuming that these communities are moving, are they going the same distance and direction that climate change is telling them to go? Are they aligning with sort of their, their um, climate space that they historically were um, a part of? And then finally, how are community changes across all of our communities influenced by climate change? Are we finding areas with the greatest levels of climate change also having the greatest amounts of turnover in our communities? And so I won't go into details about all of the model selection and so on, but we uh, essentially narrowed down a bunch of models that ranged from two to 50 communities into a best fit model that uh, contained 12 main communities. And so um, in this map, uh, you have the location of these communities at time one on the left and time two on the right. And you'll notice that each of these communities are sort of uh, clustering into their, their own part of the country as well as they're quite similar between time one and time two. So these are sort of some of the, the first steps of being, you know, determining whether this is a reasonable uh, a route to, to, to continue on. Um, there's been studies of what these forest communities are dating back to the 1950s. Uh, there was a book called The Deciduous Forest of Eastern North America by uh, Lucy Braun and uh, it was, it was good to see that we are seeing some consistent uh, patterns emerging. And so to answer our first question then of how the species composition was changing, uh, I, I just chose a couple of examples here. Um, the first being the beech maple community up in sort of the northern part of the study region. And you'll see it's made primarily of sugar maple, ash, and beech at both time periods and that the relative proportion of each of these is quite similar between the two time periods. So, so this community was relatively stable in its community or its species composition. However, when we look at this community down in the south, the southern lowland community, at time one, it was dominated primarily by slash pine um, with a smaller component of sweet bay and pond cypress. But at 
the most recent time period, there's been uh, sort of an invasion by oak species. So there's um, water oak and laurel oak and a few others that have joined this community. Um, and so it's no longer dominated by slash pine. So just in a nutshell, these uh, communities are changing their species composition, um, but it's really varying from community to community how much change is, is occurring. So the second question that I wanted to answer was whether these spatial distributions of these communities have changed. And so what I found is that all of these communities are shifting their centroids further than you would expect by random chance. So we use that same sort of weighted centroid method, but instead of the weighted centroid of a, a species, it's the weighted centroid of, of a community. And so all of these uh, went further than we expected by random chance if they were just sort of randomly uh, shifting around the country. But when we looked at where these shifts were actually occurring, they weren't really directional. We were finding that they were moving in, in all directions, some going north, some south, some east, and some west. And the thought here is that as one community moves out of an area, another community is sort of filling in behind it. And we're seeing sort of turnover in communities as opposed to losing whole forests and um, having the community shifting and leaving nothing behind. When we looked at whether the um, distance and direction that these communities actually shifted aligned with where uh, climate was telling them to go. We found that climate was saying go further um, as well as go in the other direction. Um, so quite often you, you'll see the red predicted arrows in this map are much larger than the black observed shifts um, as well as the, the direction of these arrows is, is quite often pointing in um, the opposite direction. And so here, just for example, community two, the central woodlot community, we observed that it went a, a short ways to the west, um, but it was uh, predicted to go a long ways to the east based on climate. So just to summarize, the spatial distributions of these communities are shifting further than we'd expect by, you know, sort of random, uh, random chance but these shifts are multi-directional and are not really lining up with where uh, climate change is telling them to go. And so finally, for our, our last question here, I uh, wanted to see whether these areas that had the most climate change were also those that had the most changes um, in the communities. And so what I used was a measure called Jensen-Shannon distance or JSD. And you'll see on the map on the left, areas in red are those that have higher GSD values, which are sort of less stable than the, the areas in blue. And so you'll see down in, in like Florida, it's uh, quite high levels of, of JSD, um, indicating that we're seeing great changes in the communities there. And so what we did is we uh, model JSD as a function of T1 climate and uh, different climate change variables um, using a, a generalized linear mixed effects model. And what we found is that uh, the um, that JSD was best predicted by uh, T1 climate. So we found that areas that were warmer and wetter and had lower temperature variability tended to, to change more more rapidly. However, when we looked at climate change, the only significant variables were related to temperature variability. So areas that became more temperature variable also became stable over time. So again, just to summarize, the areas that were, were in the south, especially down in uh, Florida, that are warmer and wetter and have uh, lower temperature variability, were generally less stable than, than their sort of northern, cooler, drier temperature variability uh, counterparts. And so again, just to summarize this second study, um, species composition of the communities is changing over time. We are finding that there are uh, new species joining communities as well as other species leaving them um, and changes in, in sort of the dominant species in each community. We're also finding that these communities are shifting their distributions, um, but these shifts are not necessarily aligning with climate change. They're not necessarily going the same uh, distance and direction that climate is telling them to go. And then finally, 
areas down in the south that are warmer, wetter, and have lower temperature variability were those that tended to change the most um, over the study period. And so I want to circle back now to that initial question of imagining that forest in the next 50 years. And so what I showed today is that there's probably going to be some shifts in the species composition of these forests as new species are, are sort of, or as these species are migrating, there might be new species coming into, into areas uh, or new areas, um, which is impacting what sort of the species composition of these forests are, as well as uh, potentially communities as a whole moving. There, there's some uh, communities that maybe were um, outside of, of your local area that might be making their way in, um, in the future. And of course, people always ask, well, are we going to see, for example, palm trees from Florida making it all the way up here to Indiana? And uh, the answer is no, probably not, because there's a other physiological and uh, different like soil characteristics and, and all kinds of other things that are, are sort of restricting their ranges um, besides just climate. But um, you, you might see, for example, species that are in Kentucky maybe starting to make their way up into Indiana or um, you know, a forest type that's just outside uh, maybe is, is starting to, to, to come in to, to, the, to the area. And so moving forward, um, a, a study that's been ongoing now for a couple of years um, started at the CSOI project workshop a couple of summers ago. Um, Trenton and Chathu worked with me uh, trying to identify forest communities with some uh, different machine learning uh, techniques besides uh, just LDA. And so what we ended up doing was using this uh, network-based approach called node to vec And so instead of looking at sort of what are the most uh, frequently co-occurring species in LDA, this says, let's create a giant network um, of your forest plots, uh, which ones are closest to one another. And then let's take a bunch of random walks through this networks because you can't uh, analyze a, a network that large um, sort of in a, a reasonable, uh, computationally reasonable um, amount of, of effort. Um, so what this does is it, it takes a bunch of these smaller random walks through the network and it picks up on which species are, are commonly found within these smaller uh, walks. And so what we found is that the patterns of, of these different forest communities were quite consistent. Um, so you'll see here, for example, the community in the left in purple in the Appalachian region is quite closely aligned with the community in the right um, in yellow. Um, or for example, also the community down in Florida, these, these boundaries were aligning quite nicely. Um, as well as when we looked at the species composition of these two different models, they're, they're quite similar. The Notovec model does have um, sort of the downside of it. It assigns each species to one community only versus LDA gives sort of a proportion of each species in each community. So there's a little bit more flexibility in terms of the species composition with LDA, um, but Notovec um, also is producing some really interesting results that are sort of aligning with LDA. And it's sort of showing a, a new way of looking at um, ecological data that hasn't really been done before. And so we're currently working on, on a manuscript here um, as sort of a, a methods paper of showing how this, uh, this model can be used to identify communities in, in ecological data. And so with that, I'd like to end it there and just thank my advisor and lab, uh, my committee for all giving me tons of advice over the years. And then of course, all of the co-authors on this, these papers um, and my, my research group from CSOI, Trenton and Chathu. Um, and of course, funding from USDA NIFA, um, Purdue FNR and ESC and Purdue Climate Change Research Center. And then of course, the, the Center for Science of Information uh, seed grant that allowed uh, Trenton, Chathu and I to continue on this research after the workshop. Um, so I'll, I'll go ahead and end it there and take any questions. Uh, you can also uh, feel free to reach out to me at uh, my email or on Twitter. Um, so yeah, thanks, thanks everyone for joining in. Excellent, John. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions for John?
No, I'm, uh, tell me again, what's the different, how much time is between time one and time two in your study? It was not a real long amount of time. Right, yeah, so it, it varied from state to state, um, but on average was about 30 years. Okay, so um, yeah, I'm very interested in this question, approach it um, using landscape simulation models. Uh, Landis, you probably know some of my Purdue cooperators, uh, Doug Jacobs, Pat Solner, mm -hmm. and, and Rob too, to some extent. Um, so we're finding that um, there's a, a lot of inertia to change because trees are so long lived that communities, unless there's disturbance, communities take a long time to, to shift because of the fact that climate change isn't really killing individuals, it's just changing their likelihood of regenerating and so forth. So you know, 30 or 40 years is maybe not long enough. You know, what you're seeing is really some of the the fault starts um, related to the fact that these are, that there's so much inertia in the system. Have, have, do you have any um, insights as to how much that might be true, or um, does that help you um, sort of not get too worked up about the fact that your predictions are not lining up with, with the observations? Um, I guess I would argue that you might not expect them to in such a short amount of time. Right. Yeah, that's actually a, a very good point that, um, you know, this, yeah, we did only look at a, a few decades of data, partially for just the uh, availability and reliability right. of that. Um, and, and it definitely seems like in this short period of time, there are definitely uh, other fluctuations, like you said, that are, um, you know, might be sort of uh, have a greater influence on these communities at this relatively short time scale versus, mm -hmm. yeah, if you're able to look at things across, you know, the last century or, uh, or longer. Um, but one thing that, that I guess, yeah, going along with sort of the, the thought of also uh, community resilience that, um, you know, generally when you think about, uh, at least from like a, a engineering perspective, if you have a more complex system, you tend to, you know, you're less, likely to be impacted by um, things like climate change and so it could also be somewhat of sort of an ecological buffer here that there's sort of legs uh, um, again between climate change and and how these communities are responding because of um, yeah that sort of complexity of, of these are all species that are interacting with one another and working together um, in an ecosystem or competing I guess but um, they're all they're all they're all in it together um, per se. Yeah, uh, and there's novel disturbances. You get new invasion of insects coming in. I mean, there's a whole. Yeah, you're right. It's extremely complex. And right. So yeah. Difficult to predict. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions? So John, I know that you, uh, so you're looking more at the community level, but I started thinking about it when you were, I think you mentioned 85 different species that were, were tracked over time. And did you dig into the data enough to see that there's disturbances at that level, like in, in terms of the moisture, are certain trees just more, you know, they have like maybe a higher threshold to, to water versus others, and maybe that's going to change over time? or. Yeah, that's actually a good point. We we did look um, in in a different uh, study looking at as like the trade off between uh, shade tolerance and fire fire tolerance traits, um, and so there's and there's been a, a, a quite a few different studies looking at sort of different um, yeah sort of trait diversity type measures, and um, it's definitely something that we were hoping to either maybe I should have done or could do in the future kind of thing, um, diving in a bit more into some of the um, community traits uh, um, and see if certain communities that have, yeah, sort of more um, or, you know, different traits or, or different um, physiological tolerances, if, if they're more susceptible or less susceptible to climate change. We didn't really, yeah, dig into that too much, but um, it's definitely a, it seems to be that it's not just what the species are, but it's actually how they're functioning that um, can determine how they're impacted. Yeah, not, not having much of a background in this area, but just thinking if I had to 
predict and shoot from the hip, I wouldn't have said communities would be moving westward because I, I tend to, I think a lot of people tend to think of climate change more in terms of the heat differences rather than the, the precipitation. And so when you mentioned it looks like maybe they're moving somewhat northwest, which would be tend to be drier. But now, you know, it, it just goes to show that uh, the reason why we do this kind of research, right? <laughs> So thank you very much. Uh, any other questions at this time? Uh, I'll uh, make another comment. Uh, our research also shows that CO2 fertilization is a huge driver. You know, we think of temperature, precipitation, you know, the models tend to often predict little change in precipitation in many ecosystems. But CO2 fertilization is uh, has a massive effect and it can overcome um, drought issues because there's much greater water use efficiency when there's more CO2. So um, I don't know, if, uh, sorry, that's a phone ringing in the background. I don't know how, uh, how your model, if it, if it accounts for CO2 fertilization at all, but um, that's another factor that one, uh, can, that one can and should consider. Yeah, that, that was not something that we uh, looked into uh, with this particular study, but it's definitely something that, yeah, along the, the, the many hours of doing literature review and stuff um, for my dissertation, that definitely came up as an important factor, but it seems like uh, sometimes that, that data is a little bit hard to come by, especially at sort of the, the national scale. Um, yeah, and it does require a, a mechanistic uh, modeling approach that right. that's sometimes difficult. But anyway, I mean, for your in your case, you might be another caveat that might um, be a, an important consideration as you're you know interpreting data and so forth. But right. Yeah. Again, again, nice study. Appreciate it. Chance to see it. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much, John, for joining us and presenting today. And uh, everybody, stay well. And may see you in the woods. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining.